this video or audio if you will is the church service that we did on uh, October 26 2019 uh, we were unable to do it live in the stream on YouTube or even on our WTPR radio broadcast or even on the phone for that matter because of bandwidth issues we were able to hold most of the families in the conference room on remedygod.org uh, but because we couldn't do it live I decided to go ahead and record it and put it on YouTube as a video for those of you that were unable to join us and uh, I hope and pray that you're blessed by what is shared in this sermon God bless okay all right as you know it's Q&A Sabbath and so we got a couple of Q's and some A's <laughs> and uh, this first question is going to uh, be question number 393 we're pushing at 400 <laughs> praise the Lord I think I stop at 396 and so um, this question is, how long will the tribulation and Sunday laws last? That was actually the question. And the and email says, I appreciate what I'm learning here. Just a couple of questions. How long is the little time of trouble? Do we know how long after Sunday law is that Jesus is coming? And are we told how long is the tribulation? I appreciate any info you can give if you have if you have how okay the grammar is a little messed up here so if you have how can I find info on these subjects too okay uh, like links etc I do believe we are in the last days and my focus should be on the Lord only amen and thank you for present truth okay we're not even going to do this on the phone either by the way I'm going to save every ounce of bandwidth we can I should actually shut the Wi-Fi off just to be safe okay so no the Bible doesn't say how long the little time of trouble is going to be, but just so you know, we're actually living in that time right now. We are in the little time of trouble right now. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that. Okay, hold on a second. There's something in the room here. Oh, that's okay. It says it's Joe. Uh, yeah, <laughs> never mind. Okay, uh, it looks like it could be it, either way, it could be ghosting. You know, so anyway, over two hundred thousand Christians are dying each year for their faith, and I have a tendency to believe that's actually four hundred thousand. But the news reports of years ago, they stopped reporting on this, at least with the stats. World Net Daily was the last one to actually put the stats up, and they were at one hundred seventy-six thousand, I think, at that time. At one time, I think I saw two hundred thirteen thousand, but I, I don't remember. But it got to a point where they were saying a Christian was dying every two and a half minutes for their faith uh, but like I said the last 10 years or so the media stopped reporting on it so as to keep the panic down while at the same time Muslims keep you know killing and when they keep the panic down and they don't mention the Christians being killed unless it's done in a very graphic manner where other people in other nations got wind of it because of like cities or towns nearby saw it uh, they keep it out of the public eye so as to keep the Muslims appearing to be holy and trustworthy in the public eye, even though they're the ones killing the Christians under the order of the Vatican. And uh, we're in the last days. This is what we have to expect. Okay, and so and, and people think, oh, you're just guessing it. Uh, no, no, no. I've done I've done the research. We've got the proof online. The Muslims are in fact killing the Christians for the Vatican, and the. Uh, it was prophesied to be this way, and some people are trying to twist the prophecy to make it look like Islam is the Antichrist. I got a page and a video all about that and how they're being used by Rome to take the onus off of them. So we know what the Bible says. We're going to go with the Bible. So, But the Great Tribulation, that's already come and gone. It was exactly 1,260 years. The killings and then later the formal inquisitions of Rome you know, all of it together lasted 1,260 years. It was from 538 A.D. to 1798 A.D. But because this historic fact made the Vatican look bad after they lost their political powers in 1798, you know, because they could no longer openly, uh, uh, you know, frighten the people with their bloodthirsty methods, because that's how they were able to control them back then, uh, that was actually the crux of the matter behind Napoleon's reason to attack and then remove them from power, as prophecy said they would be removed. You know, the mortal wound was administered in 1798. 
they, the Vatican, decided to use a different approach. Since they can no longer rely on their scary personage in the public eye, since it was now openly exposed as being graphically bloodthirsty and hateful, and they love to torture people, uh, Pastor Craig put up a video the other day where, and I don't know where he got these clips, but it looks so realistic, it's scary to watch about people getting tortured by Rome and the bodies vibrating and all this other stuff from what they were doing to the people. Because when you look at that stuff, you think, wow, burning at the stake is, about, is a lot easier to handle. Burning at the stake because you, you, you die pretty quick. It's a lot of pain, yeah, but, uh, well, odds are you're not even going to feel it because of prayer. Uh, but the torture that they did, and they would bring the people to the edge of death and then stop so that they would be able to prolong the torture, uh, the, the Vatican decided to stop doing that, at least publicly, and uh, so that's to make themselves appear holy, just, and pure so that, you know, everybody would wander after them, right? So the Jesuits then made up some false prophecies like the seven-year trib and a future great tribulation to make it appear as if what the popes did in the past was not prophesied by Jesus as the great tribulation in Matthew 24. If they could get the people to believe in a futuristic version of Antichrist, all the proof that the popes from day one that, conf that confirmed them to be the Antichrist using historic record and scripture would no longer be believed by the masses. And that's what they did. Yeah, some, some, some true Christians still know who the man of sin is, but the Jesuits and, and the popes of Rome have no faith in God to use that small remnant number in the way he used David in Goliath's day. And so the prelates of Rome decided under satanic inspiration, for lack of a better word, you know, just go with the numbers. In other words, let's say, like even during the time of the plagues, you got 144,000. If the plague started today, you got 144,000 and 7.7 .7 billion wicked, right? So they're going to go with the billion, right? <laughs> That's where they're going to hang their hat, you know, because they figure, oh, the, you know, the 144,000 is nothing compared to us. Well, I'm sure Goliath thought the same thing, right? And they don't realize, but so if a few mil million people like in today's world, know the truth about the popes of Rome, they don't see it as a major threat. Well, until that loud cry gets loud. Uh, because, you know, having those 7 billion people agreeing with the pope was, would help squash any opposition towards their long prophesied agenda, you know, for a one world church. And so, uh, or one world government, and then Sunday laws moving everybody to, in the world to worship, you know, Satan, and uh, along with the popes of Rome, who by now have been openly exposed as card-carrying devil worshippers because of the work we're doing. We, we, you know, we got proof now, and video proof, and pictorial proof, and documented proof that, yeah, they're devil worshippers. They're really not Christians. They never were. And, uh, and I have doc files and videos to prove all that stuff, hands down. But what, but what we, uh, we are now looking towards is not the Great Tribulation. That happened, and 500 million Christians died during that 1,260 years. What's happening now is the little time of trouble, and when the plagues begin, we will see the time of Jacob's trouble come to fulfillment. As for the long, uh, how long the Sunday laws are going to last during the buy and sell situation, again, um, we we do not know, as the Lord has not given any dates on any of this, for we know all dated prophecies ended on October 22nd, 1844. We do, however, know what will happen next. We just don't know when. Uh, and uh, we can get a guesstimate, as, in fact, in regards to the plagues themselves. I mean, uh, because um, it, it says in Revelation 18.8 that the, the, the Vatican's demise, when it's talking about the Vatican's demise and those that follow her lead, it says, it says, therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, so for, for strong is the Lord who judges her. And we know that uh, according to uh, Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4.6, in prophecy, a day equals a year. So those, those plagues will fall within a year. Not exactly a year. I, well, it could be. You know, none of us know the day or the hour, right? So... Um, Okay, next question here. This is, uh, uh, let's see, all you have is the 501c3 to push your message. 
this is kind of what the email says. The email was, I'm sorry, Nicholas, but the only treat that you, the only truth that you have on blank TV station and blank TV station and others, you know, in the Seventh Day Adventist Church, is that the organizations have a 501c3 uh, uh, tax status. He says, this is how this person responded when I said, um, look at this or look at that. Because uh, they wanted me to look at this preacher or that preacher on this television station or that te- whatever, and um, and I says I don't watch preachers that are under the five hundred one c three because they're going to come up with ninety percent of the truth and ten percent of the lies, and um, you know, if I was to post this on my website, what if a babe in Christ comes along and sees it, and um, I'll be held uh, held responsible because they'll think oh that person is you know legit because it's on this website and then all the other videos that they have it, it, it'd be kind of like um, like if uh, some heavy metal head banging rock band sang a song about Jesus and then you put that song on your website what about all the other garbage they got out there so yeah I'm not gonna no I don't do that and then I also said that I do not know of these ministries or the TV stations you speak of as I do not follow apostate leaders nor do I look at anything they write or listen to what they preach. I only look into and expose those that seek to lure some believers that are close to me and those that are popular, popular enough to lure many into sin. Uh, but having a 501c3 is all I need to know they are not obedient unto God, for if they were obedient, they would never have, you know, they would have understood prophecy about the building of the image of the beast, of which they are fulfilling as we speak. The only way to understand prophecy is to obey the God that wrote it. The fact that they all signed the 501c3 proves they do not have eyes to see and therefore eternally dangerous and deadly to anyone that trusts them and their tainted sermons. If they have not eyes to see such a basic prophecy as the image of the beast, then their sermons will be tainted with lies. There's no way of getting around it because they don't worship the God of the Bible. Uh, and so, because Satan's only going to bless those that obey him in the same way Christ is going to bless them that obey him, right? So 100% of every Seventh-day Adventist ministry that has, and they all have, the 501c3, all of them must bow in unison with the second beast of Revelation, which is, in fact, the United States government. And these pastors do this willingly under the guidance of the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church that holds their first of many 501c3 contracts. And these apostate GC leaders declare those uh, through their many strategically selected puppets that Allah is God, homosexual marriage is okay, Sunday keeping SDA churches is no big deal, and women can be pastors just to, you know, ordained pastors, just to name a few. The others under the 501c3 web of control need not even openly declare their agreement with such things in the same way the prelates of Rome play their church politics by having some priests openly agree while some quietly disagree and some simply clam up with whatever, you know, the Vatican wants to preach, right? Well, they say one thing publicly and another thing on the pulpits so as to keep the people in the pews. Rome has used that tactic for centuries, and it works. And be it known unto you, saying nothing, like these SDA pastors that clam up about what they know is going on in the GC, saying nothing means the pastors are just as guilty by agreement or by a cowardly heart that is now under the control of Rome, regardless of what the denomination that they claim the, they claim the stand in. The fact that the Seventh-day Adventist Church and every other so-called Protestant church sent tithe money to the Pope through its uh, uh, um, national council, um, churches, and, uh, and world council of churches is proof of that fact. And so I say to you, who I declare is a dear and precious soul in the eyes of both your Father in heaven and is obedient around the people who warn you, if having a 501c3 is not enough to prove you must depart from you know, their side, then you, need, then you too need to repent. You know, you know, for the obedient remnant people of God know the prophetic word, and we know the clear red flag saying that's waving you know, in the prophetic wind of that long prophesied contract with the second beast and how it will be used to finish creating the image of the beast in America and, and where, where it becomes publicly recognized as a church and state conglomeration. Yes, they have officially become that image on December 2nd, 2017, when Trump signed, you know, the 501c3 into law. 
with the stroke of that pen, all the churches under the 501c3 became official government agencies, as you know, President Bush called it when he wrote the originating 501c3 executive order so as to start to give life, a life-giving process onto that image that was originally penned by Lyndon Johnson in 1954. So if you look into the writing of the law that you, you will come to see, that um, many that have it in and outside the church are legally obligated to do as Jesuits have done for centuries, to keep the pews filled with their victims, of which, dear one, you are now defending a defending member of same, and I'm, that I am sad to say for you, because to defend these people to do these things is, is deadly. I mean, as prophesied, they will preach what the people want to hear, and they will do this hellish act claiming to be you know, one in the church while standing in agreement with the very beast that will soon mark them for damnation. And so to put it plainly, when I see the 501c3 or even the 501c4 contract, you know, you know, like, like guys like Andrew Enriquez or um, I can't remember, there was a couple other guys out there that I do know that have a 501c3 4 or a, a 501c4. Uh, you can't trust these guys. You, you, you simply can't trust them because I don't care if they're foreigners or not and say, oh, it's just they thought it was an American thing. And No, it doesn't matter. you got a Bible no matter what country you're in. You know, if they cannot see the prophesied warning about that contract, then he cannot be, you cannot hear the voice of the Lord to even write a blessed sermon that the people need to hear. And some people say, well, he's got a lot of big numbers. Says, yeah, well, <laughs> that right there lets you know that... Uh, it's not part of the remnant. <laughs> you know, this, the remnant of a seed isn't known to be, you know, popular. So anyway, uh, for the God of the Bible is not going to give utterance unto those that hate him. And some say, well, that's a pretty blunt and bold statement. Well, yeah, if you don't love him, there's not, you know, there's no, there's nothing in the Bible that says you can tolerate God or, or kind of like hang out with him once in a while. No, it's either you love or hate. You know, there's no gray areas there. You know, and, and in other words, if you don't confess and repent of every sin before that latter rain falls, you're never going to get it. You'll never be in heaven. Period. When probate, when if you're alive, when probation ends, and the plagues begin, if you haven't confessed, my wife and I were just reading about this this morning in the uh, in regards to the plagues and what what what, what occurs, uh, and because um, we're I'm, I'm in the process of doing another study in regards to all this. I'm trying to figure out the. I want to know exactly when and why or how Christians are being killed uh, before uh, you know the, the death decree is put out you know uh, so anyway um, it's, but just to finish this out as I've been saying for decades the only way to understand Christian prophecy is to obey the Christian guy that wrote it and, and in today's world very few can be trusted to stand let alone preach from that sacred desk but then that is just one more factor of this end time society we find ourselves in. And so, uh, question number 395. And this really kind of ticks me off that we're not in the stream right now because uh, the people on the stream, they love this kind of stuff. And I'm surprised there's hardly anybody here in the room. But I know we, we got a lot of people with power outages and stuff like that too. But anyway, this question is, what does Paul mean in uh, Romans 14 verses 2 to 14 uh, no, uh, Romans 14, verses 2, and then verses 14 and 15, and then verses 20 and 21. And he says, Hi, Brother Nick, I just wanted to say thanks for helping me out with my last question regarding who is Israel today. You really helped me out. I have one more question. What does Paul mean in those verses I just recited? And I'll read them here. Well, he, he put them in the email, so I'm assuming that's the verses he has issue with. He says, for one, this is what the verses are. It says, for one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat. For whom Christ died, for meat destroy not the work of God. He's 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 skipping a lot of spots in these verses. Uh, All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. I wonder if he's even using the King James here. 
Uh, it is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. And then he says, some use this verse to preach that there is no unclean foods and eating uh, it won't defile you. They, are, they also use 1 Corinthians 10 31 that says, wherefore, or yeah, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God to be uh, to justified. I guess he, uh, he didn't finish typing it out. No, he's all to the glory of God. So I don't know where his comments end. Let's see, it's just uh, to, to just, what? I'm going to read it from, thanks, Brother Sean. Yeah, it ends there, to the, to the glory of God. All right, so I'm just going to delete this stuff that he put in here afterwards because it's, uh, it makes people think that that could be part of the verse. I'm not, gonna, I'm not even going to say it. Anyway, first and foremost, this does not apply to unclean foods, you know, th those verses from Romans, um, because the Jews already knew about unclean foods in particular, like physically, you know, uh, physically unclean foods. I better put that in there. All right. Um, this has to do with the food becoming spiritually unclean instead. There's a difference. You must always keep what you read in context as to the topic at hand as well as uh, who's talking and who's being spoken of and even the time frame, like when it was being spoken. So this speaks of flesh foods, yes, but this meat can also be seen as meaty scripture or doctrine when the need arises, just so you know. But in this context, however, the flesh is that of animal, animals that can be eaten. They're clean because the Jews would not even touch on clean foods in the first place. But here's the clincher. The key reason is in, for, uh, for the chapter is, uh, is uh, for the whole chapter is Romans chapter 14, verses 5 and 6. So it says, One man esteemeth one day above another, and another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth that the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. I threw in the thing about the, the day thing, because a lot of people like to use that one to say that means that we don't have to keep Sabbath because you know, I'll pick any day I want. I got to be fully persuaded. Oh no, sorry, that has to do with holidays, you know. But people like to take stuff out of context because preachers do it for them. But if the if the man does, if if the man does not know it is sin to follow after like these holidays or these pagan festivals, because that's what it really means, uh, it is not counted as sin against him any more than it would be if he ate clean food at that festival. For it's written in Acts seventeen thirty. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all or commandeth all men everywhere to repent. You know, all too often people are following the truth we preach simply because it sounds good or sounds correct, or their parents teach it, let's say. But compelled assent to any doctrine or even any prophetic fact we may press on them or or even get them to, in agreement that feast days are abolished without being convinced in their own minds. All of this would be hypocritical at best in their hearts and eventually of no avail because eventually they're going to walk away from it anyway. they got to be convinced in their own minds. They can't be robotic in worship. They're, they can't worship. The, see, that's what I realized when I was a Catholic. I said, do I really believe this stuff? One day I sat down and put the rosary off to the side and I think, do I? Because this is like towards the tail end of when I was finally reading a Bible to shut these Baptist ups that kept coming up to me and telling me I was going to hell because I was Catholic. So I sat down and says, do I really believe this stuff that Rome teaches or do I believe the stuff that God teaches in the Bible? You know, I had to put aside that my mom and dad were teaching this stuff that Rome taught too. I had to put all that aside because I know what it says in the Bible about I got to love Jesus more even than, than them. And so, uh, and that's what we always got to do. And so if the person doesn't get to that point, then it's going to be hypocritical for them to follow our lead simply because we said it. Uh, it sounds better because you sound like it was correct. You put it up and you hung out all the brass tacks and the rubber hit the road or whatever, you know, and it all seemed good to them, right? But it never sunk into the heart. They just realized, they just followed after, in other words, there were a preacher echo. That's not going to really help you when those plagues start falling because you're not really walking the way you should. But 
I mean, if they if they if they're going to bow to our opinions easily without us thus saith the Lord, sooner or later someone else is going to come up and pull them out of the way just as easily as if they have a better way of fabricating a lie. Let's say you know, because the truth as we presented it to that was just truth as it's presented. But a, somebody else that can, that's really crafty can come up and present lie like a truth, and it'll make sense to them, and they'll put down the truth that we presented simply because the lie looked more attractive and it made more sense to them, let's say. I mean, real Bible study is what's going to bring the answer here. Isaiah, uh, Isaiah 1, verse 18 says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. And so even if the meat is clean, if it offends your brother for you to eat it, then don't eat it, because in his mind it is considered spiritually unclean. In other words, there are ways some look upon clean food as unclean via correct or even misunderstood doctrine. And so Christians, as Christians, we must not tempt them to think lesser of our God by our example. What I mean is, if I were to walk into a Chinese restaurant knowing they have a Buddha on display for those patrons to worship, and all that is offered on the plates might even be offered onto that idol as their, you know, as per their religion in some of these restaurants. That's what they do. That's just part of how they are with the Buddhists. If there's a statue, that's what they're going to offer all their money and their patrons and all the food they make for the people. It's all being offered onto that statue, right? But if as a Christian, uh, but if, you know, if I as a Christian eat it all, it, it is well. It is between me and the true God I worship when I give thanks for the meal because I know it's a false God that they worship and it has no power over me or even what I'm eating. I'm, you know, I, I give thanks unto God for the meal. It totally trumps their statue. It's totally gone. You know, but if someone that knows I'm a Christian but doesn't understand the word of God to know the difference as it is laid out in doctrine when it comes to this, then I would not go in that restaurant with them so as to prevent them from being offended. 1 Corinthians 10, 28 says, But if any man say unto you, This is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake. You know, your friend's saying, Oh, we can't eat it because it's offered unto idols. Well, then don't eat it for his sake. It says, Eat, it, eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience' sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. In other words, you could eat it, but still don't, because it's going to make your brother, because you know, the Lord owns it all anyway. In other words, that statue has no power, like I just said a minute ago. So, in fact, Paul confirms this by saying this in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 25 and 27, a couple of verses prior. He says, Whatsoever is sold in the shambles that eat, asking no question for conscience' sake. All right? Because you might feel a little bit, oh, you mean you're offering this up to Kamosh or Baal or what? So, he says, eat not, uh, he says, uh, uh, what did he say here? Yeah, asking no question for conscience sake. And then verse 26, he says, For the earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, if any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and ye be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no question for conscience sake. And so that is why we see what we see in what, you originally shared from Romans chapter 14 that said, it is good neither to eat flesh nor drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. But read verse 28 again. It says, but if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it and for conscious sake for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And as for 1 Corinthians 10 31, again, Jews that are now Bible believing um, you know, Messiah embracing Christians are the ones being addressed here. And they know for a fact why their God, our God, declared certain things are unclean. To this day, science is going to tell you that the meats declared unclean in Scripture are actually the foods that cause all sorts of disease to this day. No getting around that one. And so Jews that become Christians knew eating certain unclean foods and things uh, you know, would not give glory to God. Still, some that desire the bloody hamburger and worm-infested pork chop is still going to use First Timothy chapter four verses four and five out of context to eat them anyway. Which says, and and literally, they they I have seen people do this. 
they're chomping on a pork chop that's all covered in you know worms on the inside they don't know the worms are there because they never did the test but they're always there you can't even cook them out oh cook it to a certain degree no it's not going to kill them you could prove it just by putting a pork chop in an oven at 500 degrees for three hours take out that charcoal briquette <laughs> it's, it's it's a black chunk of car- charcoal now you can't even eat it it's just a it's a brick let it cool down put a put a nice white sheet of uh, typing paper on your counter break open that um, pork chop and sift through the ashes you'll find what looks like little footballs it kind of looks like mouse droppings grab one of them with a pair of tweezers and get a magnifying glass if you need to and crack one of them open that worm is still alive in there try it or just get a pork chop and pour a bunch of coca-cola on it these uh the carbonic acid i think they use in there makes the worms get out of that meat they all start coming they'll they'll just rise up out of the out of the out of the uh, the meat and be all over the surface of it and try to get off to the edges it's pretty gross they, I, I think i think people did that on youtube where you can see the worms just coming out but they actually use this verse first timothy chapter 4 verses 4 and 5 to say it's okay to eat pork chops because it says for every creature of god is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving they forget about that part and for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. And so they will say, yeah, I can eat this sewage filtering clam because I gave thanks to God for it. But this is what they ignore on two points. Number one, Paul said you can eat it when it is received with thanksgiving. Their problem here is that they cannot see that our God clearly said, do not eat the unclean things all along. And so how can they give thanks for a meal our god never gave them to eat in the first place because he declared it unclean so you can't give them thanks for that that's why he said if it be received with thanksgiving it would be like thanking me for a million dollars i gave them when i never even gave them a dime (laughs) same thing it just makes no sense and then number two verse five is obvious unclean foods were never and never will be sanctified ever not even in uh, new jerusalem because we're not going to be eating anything with a face up there. All right, so the last one. What was the 1844 Great Disappointment? This is question number 396. And then the email just said, where can I find the 1884 Great Controversy, or the Great Disappointment, rather, in actual Scripture? Where can I find it? And the answer is Revelation 10, verses 9 and 11. Okay, let me read this here and it says and i went unto the angel that's john he's in vision and said unto him give me the little book and he said unto me take it eat it up and it shall be it shall make thy belly bitter but it shall be in thy mouth as sweet as honey and i took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up and it was in my mouth sweet as honey and as soon as i had eaten it my belly was bitter and he said unto me thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings the message was sweet in that the Millerites back then thought Jesus was actually returning October 18, uh, October 22nd, 1844. Boy, it's like sweet as honey in the mouth, right? For real Christians, that is. We were talking about that last night, as a matter of fact, in the, in the SOP readings. Some people really were kind of relieved he didn't come back, whereas the other was, you know, the 50 that were left out of the 50,000 were sad. But, uh, and so it was actually sweet in the mouth because it was sweet to pronounce Jesus is coming, right? But it was bitter in their belly when he didn't come. Uh, they got the date correct, though, but the event was wrong. And as a matter of fact, that was the last prophetic date, by the way. The end of the 2300-year prophecy, yeah, 2300-year prophecy was declared by Daniel to end specifically on October 22, 1844. But the end of the prophecy meant the sanctuary was to be cleansed. The Millerites thought the sanctuary was earth and so they naturally thought the cleansing was christ returning to earth with fire but they later found out after going into more bible study that's the 50 that wanted him to come back and then he didn't come back they went back into the bible the rest of the people were just all relieved and went back to their lives and it probably didn't fare well with them but they went back they they, they went after more bible study and they found that the earth is not the sanctuary at all Moses received a pattern of the real sanctuary that, as we know, is still 
and always will be in heaven. And that's why I said Moses received the pattern. Uh, and, and this is why we've been studying the sanctuary as we have for a couple of years, I think, now in our uh, church services because um, that's important. Um, the sanctuary is something that is in heaven. And uh, so they didn't get that part. But the ending of that 2300-year prophecy meant that the real sanctuary in heaven was to begin cleansing on that date, which we know to be the start of the investigated judgment so that when Jesus finally does return to earth, all judgment's already done, except, of course, the executive part at the end of the thousand years, but you know what I mean. Uh, But in fact, it'll be done at the start of the plagues. For when the plagues begin, it clearly says... And there's no getting around this one. It says Revelation 22, verses 11 and 12. And thanks again, Brother Sean, for for uh, putting in the verses like that. It's good to see Brother Dwayne's got his power back on. Uh, but uh, anyway, Revelation 22, verses 11 and 12 says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, or he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. So when the plagues fall, all the lost will forever remain lost. Even though they're still alive, because the plagues fall within a day, we know that. That's a, uh, uh, Okay, good to know. So, but when the plagues fall, all the lost will, will forever remain lost, and all the saved will forever remain saved. Uh, th- th- that's why the prophet Amos said what he did long ago in Amos chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. Uh, he said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor of thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. And brothers and sisters, tell as many as people as you love that they, they got to read this one. Amos 8. I mean, they, this, this scares me for loved ones because they won't even read their Bibles and they're getting prepared to not read them. They're getting prepared to, to have that mindset that Amos said the wicked will have. I mean, the lost are going to be wandering to and fro looking for a true preacher that will vindicate them in their lost state using Scripture, but by this time, the only Christians alive are the 144,000. And they would never lie and jeopardize their salvation just to please a few people. I mean, the lost will finally come to realize at the start of the plagues that all those crazy or fanatical Jesus freaks, as they call us, were 100% correct. All that we said will happen has now happened. And they now realize they are lost. But because they never read their Bibles in the first place, before the plagues even came, they do not know that it is too late for them now. They actually think they can find a Bible verse or a real Christian to vindicate them and remove them from their abject fear of damnation. But the prophecy is clear. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. They're forever lost. And to, for, and to further confirm the doctrine of the investigated judgment commencing on October 22nd, 1844, which was actually the 10th day of the seventh month in the original Hebrew calendar that was used to actually get the final prophesied date, and that's why Rome changed the calendars, is to try to make it difficult for us to find out the dates on these, you know, prophecies of Daniel. Uh, And I say final date, uh, because it was also prophesied that end-time prophecies from that day forward will never be given a specific date, period. You know, there's a lot of SDAs out there that actually think otherwise, thanks to guys like David Gates. But to confirm the judgment started already and ends at the start of the plagues is easy to see if you have eyes to see for two reasons. Number one, the prophecy stated, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. That means... Whatever state the soul is in when those plagues begin will never again change for all eternity. That's why I said you better confess and repent everything before those plagues start, which can happen any, any you know, soon, you know. Satan's got to appear first, obviously, but, you know, we don't have a lot of time left. And if you wait till Satan appears, well, then that's it. You're, you're going to fall for it because you won't be ready 
you're not going to be able to handle that angel, that fallen angel, right? So if you're lost at this time, you're going to remain lost. But if you're saved at this time, you're going to remain saved. In other words, you have been judged, lost, or you have been judged, saved for all eternity when the plagues begin. And so the previous years from 1844 forward were in fact used to judge the living and the dead for un unless they were used for that purpose. Explain how the judgment is finished at the start of the plagues, which is about one year before Jesus returns. For it is also prophesied those plagues will fall within a year. Revelation 18 8 clearly says, Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord that judgeth her, or who judgeth her. And according to prophetic definitions of both Numbers 14.34 and Ezekiel 4, verse 6, it says, I have, I have given thee a day for a year. Uh, or no, I have appointed thee each day for a year. And, and then number two, and we'll close with this. The prophecy also stated, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. And so I have to ask, how is it possible for Christ to bring his reward unto all individuals on the planet at his coming, unless, of course, all have been judged and the rewards have already been decided? And so, again, they got the date correct, but the event was wrong, and it was prophesied they would do that. So that's another nice feather in the cap of the remnant people for up to today. Jesus, well, you know, there are, the SDAs aren't remnant anymore, by the way. We, we have all sorts of proof to back that up. Videos, in fact, too. But Jesus wasn't returning on October 22nd, 1844. All right? And he, he was simply going to start to judge the living and the dead at that time. So that when he returns, as promised, he's going to bring all of mankind the rewards that they, they deserve with him. Some will receive the reward of eternal life, and sadly, the majority, billions, are going to receive the reward of, you know, reward of uh, eternal damnation. And so I hope and pray that we're all going to be in the good number, you know, the, the 144,000, or we're going to be those that rise up. Uh, you know, the dead in Christ shall rise, like if we die before the plagues. And if any of us that have been doing this work, by the way, you might want to check this out in Spirit of Prophecy. If any of us have been doing the work of this, you know, the three angels' messages in our lifetime, like most of us in this church are already doing, if we die before the plagues hit, like if the Lord allows us to take a nap before that all goes down, we will rise along with all the people, the pioneers of the SDA church, the real ones, the obedient ones, you know, like Ellen White, James White, and you know, a few others and quite a bunch of the people that were involved in spreading the message and all that other stuff, they're all going to rise up and then be with the 144,000. They won't be in the number of the 144,000 because they only the 144,000 can sing that song. That, that they, they, they only have that experience. They, own, they alone will have a, that duty. And, uh, and so that's what we strive on to. We want to be in that number. But if you don't make it to that number, at least you will be with them when they see it all go down and we'll be watching the dead in Christ rise if we die and all that stuff. And so praise the Lord for that. And so if you can, uh, well, we'll um, have a song. Somebody want to do a song and then we'll, uh, we'll pray.